think I'm going to start. Uh, and thank you very much for uh, coming and attending the Grand Rounds this morning. So on behalf of Cardiovascular Division, I'm really excited to present uh, one of our own uh, uh, stars here, Dr. Laurel Brown. So Dr. Brown, as uh, many of you already know, uh, she has been a very active uh, academic uh, physician and uh, is well known now uh, locally and nationally. And uh, of course, uh, uh, you know, wherever she has gone, people have recognized her very uh, quickly. So very briefly, she did uh, her uh, MD from Johns Hopkins uh, University and then subsequently did her internal medicine as well as cardiology fellowship uh, there. Uh, she came and joined us about five years ago and very rapidly has risen in the ranks. Uh, she is an assistant professor of medicine and also uh, the currently the director of our cardiovascular fellowship program. In addition, uh, she's also the uh, director of the resuscitation program in the state, I guess, uh, or in locally as well. So uh, she uh, has throughout her career, her interest has not only been clinical, but academic and developing uh, curriculums for the students, teaching the students, and essentially has won major awards, both uh, during uh, her training as a, uh, at uh, Johns Hopkins, including Alpha Omega, uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, you know, inductee. She won the Florence uh, Sabin College Most Outstanding Graduate Award at Johns uh, Hopkins. Uh, she was the most outstanding intern, again at Johns Hopkins, and she got the hair. Once she came here, she won the Stuart Urbeck uh, Award for Excellence in Faculty. Uh, teaching. Uh, she was the distinguished faculty educator in 2015. She is an outstanding clinical faculty uh, division award, Kentucky chapter ACP faculty award, Stemler award, which is a very prestigious national award where she won the <clears throat> investigator of the year award uh, at uh, Northwestern uh, University in Chicago. And uh, again, uh, in our own division, she was voted as the uh, outstanding clinical uh, faculty. Uh, she has basically participated in every committee and uh, uh, in the university, especially that relates to uh, resident student uh, curriculum as well as uh, uh, training in the CPR and CCU and so on and on. She already has a 10 page uh, CV, so I'm not going to read all of it. <laughs> and uh, but uh, very briefly, and uh, she she lectures widely wherever she's invited. She's uh, she's uh, always uh, there. Uh, to, to do that. And one of the things I was looking at the media appearances, she's the face of cardiology and University of Louisville. She's been invited at least 30 times to various uh, channels. And I'm sure a lot of us, I've seen you on, on TV and, and, and many of us have. Uh, she has been able to write grants and has won grants uh, during uh, a very short but very distinguished career already at uh, university. Uh, she's a journal reviewer for many of uh, 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 journals especially in the field of uh, academics and CPR. And already she has uh, uh, at least 14 uh, uh, publications, including one we did together. So uh, she has written three book chapters and on and on. So uh, Laurel really has been a face of uh, CPR teaching. And uh, I mean, her style of teaching is very unique. All of us do ACLS now on the computer and <laughs> and and push on the on the mannequins, but uh, really it's a it's a continuous uh, moving uh, field in in CPR. And I won't take much of uh, your time. And I'm really excited to present my uh, young colleague, Dr. Laurel Brown. Thanks, Sahel. <laughs> Thank the moral of the story for the trainees is every single thing you do, you write it down on your CV so that someday someone's standing up and you're embarrassed by all the things you put on your CV. Um, the one award that I am, I should be honest that I didn't win, that I hoped we were going to, we actually applied for a daytime Emmy award for the video I'm gonna show you today. And we just found out yesterday we were not nominated the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade was nominated in our category, but not us. So I'm still a little hurt by that, but uh, at least I get to show you our film today. So uh, for those of you who've ever heard any of my talks on CPR, some of this is going to be a bit of a review. 
Uh, but I'm really excited to show you how we have progressed in our work since the last time I presented here. So once again, we're going to talk about the gaps between best practices, what we know about CPR and what's actually happening out in the world. Um, we're going to talk about CPR skill retention with our current methods of training because none of you thought that CPR training could be so interesting, but I'm going to teach you a lot about it today. I'm going to show you the ongoing educational program that we have created, which we're trying to sweep the nation with. And of course, I have a total um, interest in you telling everyone you know about Heart Class, which is the video I'm going to show you today that we made. So this is a bit of a review, but just to remind you what we're talking about in the scale of the problem. Every year, there are 350,000 out of hospital cardiac arrests. The survival rate is very poor. I say one in 10 when I'm talking to the lay public. We're up in the around the 12% range, but that has not moved too much over the last five years. There's a huge geographic variation in survival, so it can be as low as 3% or as high as 22%. If you're in Seattle, you're actually not allowed to die from cardiac arrest. It's kind of a thing there. I, I have a friend who literally watched a bystander do CPR on an alive person because Seattle is so uh, into bystander CPR. So I see this problem really as an opportunity because if we can just move the needle 1%, just a 1% increase in survival, that translates to 3,500 people that get to go spend Thanksgiving with their families every year. So for me, this is why I spend my time trying to move the needle here. A very small incremental change has a large absolute benefit. This is a review slide if you've been to any of my lectures, so just want to hammer the point home. Is that Can anyone tell me what are characteristics either of the cardiac arrest itself or of the patient that we know help to determine survival? What might influence it? You know my lectures are interactive, so somebody's going to have to speak up at 8 a.m. You also saw these, so you know someone's coming up here later. Just get prepared. If I know your name, you're probably at risk. Okay, what are some characteristics that impact survival? Good, so rhythm, shockable versus unshockable rhythm. Good, so we say um, uh, initiation of bystander CPR, absolutely. Age, yep. What else? So you said time to CPR, um, time to defibrillation for a shockable rhythm, and then time to return of circulation, right? We know this, the longer that you're down, the less likely that you are to survive. Anything else you could think of? about witnessed or unwitnessed, so if they're in public and there's, we watch them go down versus if they're at home. Okay, so you got a few of them. I'll let you warm up a little bit. It is 8 a.m. What I've shown here is, in bold, the only two factors that we can do anything about. We have absolutely no way to impact any of the others, but we can impact time to defibrillation and whether or not they get bystander CPR. So again, what we know, I didn't show you this data, but I have before, we know that bystander CPR improves survival. There's no question there. But the rate overall of CPR in this country is low. 31% is the last time that it was really published. The most recent estimates are closer to the 45% range, so we have made some improvement, but that's nowhere near as high as they get in Scandinavia. We also know very clearly that the variation in survival is a linear relationship to the variation in bystander CPR. So if you look at counties where there's high rates of bystander CPR, they have high rates of survival, and the converse is also true. So again, this is an opportunity. We know that bystander CPR is the single most modifiable factor that influences survival. It turns out that being trained in CPR is the strongest predictor of whether or not you'll do CPR. I know that seems very straightforward, but someone published it, so I'll put it up there. So if we increase the rate of CPR training, it stands to reason that we're going to impact survival. This is like that thing in high school. If A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. Remember that? Okay, that's how I've come to the conclusion of how I spend my life. So in recognition of this, the American Heart Association set a goal that we would increase our rate of bystander CPR overall in the nation from 31 to 62% by the year 2020, which is like a few months away. We're not going to hit that goal, but uh, it's an, a reason that I use to justify all of my grants. So do we have any evidence that this is actually going to work to impact survival? Because we're talking about a lot of resource utilization here. Well, this was published in New England Journal, and this is data from Sweden. As always, Scandinavia is way ahead of us when it comes to resuscitation. And Sweden undertook a large uh, national program to increase their rates of bystander CPR training. 
And so on the first graph here, we're looking at two things. This is time. The first is CPR before EMS arrival, so bystander CPR. And that is the blue dashed line, so that you can see that that's going up with time. Over here, it's the number of people trained in CPR in the million. So you see this nice correlation that as they've trained more people, the rate of bystander CPR improved. Back in 2010, they were already around 70% bystander CPR, which is pretty impressive. So, okay, great, so more people did CPR because they were trained, well, did that work? So down here we have survival over time. Two different groups, the, in a black dotted line, this is those who did not get CPR before the paramedics arrived. So that survival has a little bit of variation, but not much, as you can imagine, because they didn't get CPR, so they're not gonna survive. But the green dashed line shows you the patient population that got CPR before EMS arrival, and you see this increase in their survival rate. You might wonder, well, why is it high over here and goes up? Probably because uh, the denominator was low here and who they were reporting. This is when they introduced telephone CPR, so having the operator for their 911 equivalent. I don't know what it is there. 911 Sweden. Uh, so having them tell you how to do CPR over the phone. So we have evidence from a large country-wide program for CPR training that it actually leads to people surviving. So the focus that we have currently is on CPR in high schools, and I'm going to show you why. So as time has gone along, the states that are shown in red are those that have passed laws requiring CPR training before graduation. This seems like a no-brainer, right? Of course you'd want to treat, you have a captive audience, we teach them, we have a health class, so this would be a great life skill to teach them. But it turns out that it's been quite a push to try and get these laws passed. I am proud to say that Kentucky does have a law. And right now there's 39 states with laws that are either passed or about to be passed. There's a few others that have them in the docket, and there's a few holdouts. I don't know what their problem is, but there's a few complaints like, well, this is an unfunded mandate to the schools, and they already are strapped for resources, and so we're going to require them to do something that, that requires more resources without funding it, part of what I'm working on. So we have these laws. Okay, great. We did a lot of advocacy work in order to get the laws passed. And if we look at the numbers, there are 16 million high school students in the US every year. So that's about 4 million that are graduating a year. 82% of them live in states that have a law. So there's still almost 20% that don't have a law requiring high school graduation. So that means almost a million, 700,000 graduate every year without CPR training. And that's actually looking at each state and all that kind of thing. So that's a lot of that aren't getting trained under the current laws. Well, we had some questions here. So we wanted to understand a little bit about the laws because they're in each state. Are they different? And mostly we wanted to know how are they being implemented on the ground? So we went into the state laws and we made this beautiful map, which we were happy to get published in uh, Jack, which is our, one of our big cardiology journals. Um, and this work was done right here with actually some of the medical students. So in gray are the states with no law as of the publication time, which was 2017. Blue are the states that have a law, and in the law they specify that the method you train with has to be, quote, nationally recognized. That pretty much means American Heart or Red Cross, and I'm going to get into that a little bit more later. So all of those states basically require you to be trained through American Heart or Red Cross training programs. The states where a red dot is on the capital are those that also say something in the law about AED training. Either you have to learn something about an AED, some of them say you have to practice, but most of them just say you need to learn and be uh, familiar with an AED. And then um, in green are the states that have a law, but they don't care how you're trained. They're just like, great, have them push on something and have a nice day. And then lastly, in the red outline, are those states that require the instructor to be a certified instructor. That is kind of shocking if you think about it, right? Because that means in all the rest of the states, anybody can pick up the American Heart book and just teach you how to do CPR. So if we just break this down a little bit by percentage, again, the majority are going to say you need to use American Heart or Red Cross. And this is the one that shocks me the most. Only 8% of the states say that the instructor needs to be a certified instructor. Now, this is trying to be a balance, right, between the mandate and actually just getting them to train in CPR. And I think the conventional teaching is, well, any training is good. I do agree that some training is better than no training, but I also know that there's a difference in training methods because that's what I study. I want to just for a moment pause and talk quickly about CPR, quote, certification. 
So CPR certification is made up a little bit. The reason it's made up is because there's a total monopoly in the CPR training space. If you look at American Heart as a public company, and so they publish how much they make per year on CPR training. CPR training revenue, that's in thousands. So this is $150 million that American Heart makes every year for the courses that you all go to to get your training so that you can work in this hospital. So clearly, they don't want anything to disrupt the CPR training space because they're making a lot of money. If you look at Red Cross, it's even harder to tell because they lump their products and services together. And I'm pretty sure this is where CPR training comes under. And again, this is going to be in thousands. But it's a little bit harder to tell, but I think we're in a similar range of how much American Red Cross makes every year. Not only that, but Lairdall, which is the company that makes the majority of the mannequins, there's no way to know how much they're making. They're not a public company. So there's a lot of money that's being traded in this space. And therefore, these people don't want disruption of the, of the uh, CPR training space. I'm going to come back to that in a minute when I talk about my program and why um, we're struggling a little bit to try and get this out there nationally. But it's because of finance. Okay, so when it comes to training, I already have told you this, but we all know there's a big difference. There's different kinds of courses. There's different mannequins from this inflatable one, which is totally not like a real human chest. Creepy mannequins, very um, sophisticated mannequins where the brain lights up if you're getting brain perfusion. And instructors range from disinterested to overly enthusiastic, one could argue. So there's a huge difference. So we wanted to know from the high schools themselves what's actually going on. So we did a survey across the nation. We just sent emails to everyone. And we got actual high school teachers to send us back the survey telling us, how are you teaching CPR? So the size of these dot represents the number of responses. So we had a pretty good spread from east to west, but mostly centered in the Midwest mostly public schools, and split half and half between urban and rural. And this is pretty much a good representation of the country overall. So we asked them a bunch of questions. First of all, what type of training program are you using? Overwhelming majority, American Heart. What mannequin type? I was happy to see that most of them are using non-inflatable mannequins, which is this guy over here. But still a decent amount are using inflatable mannequins. Um, we asked about AED training, again, right around that 60-70% range are doing some sort of AED training. And then this is another lesson learned for those of you who are designing studies. I asked this question wrong. I asked, um, is the instructor CPR certified? Not, is it a certified CPR instructor? Makes a difference, right? So still, what's a little shocking is that a lot of them are not even CPR certified themselves and are still teaching CPR. So this shows us that there's a lot of variability. So there's variability in the laws, despite very simple recommendations from the AHA about what should be in a course. They say, you've got to practice hands-on CPR, you've got to recognize arrests and know to call 911, and you should be taught something about an AED. That's it. Despite that, there's some variation in the laws. And then there's a lot of variability in implementation, which is not too surprising. I have a higher standard. I think that you should practice hands-on, you should uh, know something about an AED, you should absolutely be on a non-inflatable mannequin because I'm convinced it's superior. And you should be taught by someone who knows what they're doing. So if I apply that standard to the schools that responded, only 23% of them are meeting that standard, which seems kind of like the basics. That means we have over a million students receiving substandard training every year. That's in addition to those who weren't getting trained at all. So we're missing a chance, really, to train 2 million rescuers every year and under our current paradigm. So I mentioned this before, but when we talk about CPR courses, it turns out it's not really that easy to get a new course out into the mainstream. The reason is that there is no accrediting body that can say this CPR training course meets our stamp of approval. The American, uh, the actual, the guidelines are made by ILCOR, the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation. AHA is part of that guideline making process. So they make the guidelines on the science side, and then on the business side, AHA sells the product. There's nobody that I can take my course to and say, can you please certify this and recognize it? So that means that there's, again, this total monopoly. And that also means that there's no body that's um, evaluating the effectiveness of CPR courses. Because I think for a long time, people have just thought, oh, CPR training, it's all the same. Well, I beg to differ, and I'm going to show you some data. I've shown you this before, but just to quickly go through with a lot of the medical students, we went into high schools who were trained by standard training. Okay, not our program, but just standard training. And we looked at their CPR skill retention six months after training. 
What we found in, in this gray line here is those who have the rates at appropriate 100 to 120. This is only about 30% of the students were able to perform chest compressions at appropriate rate six months after training. If you look at depth, <clears throat> similarly, it was about 30% who got their chest compressions, <clears throat> excuse me, more than 70% of the compressions at the appropriate depth. We chose 70% because that's about what healthcare providers do on their best possible day. By the way, we all think we're real good at CPR. We're not. That's a different story, though. Okay. So if I combine rate and depth, <clears throat> which both matter, only 12.4% of the students could perform high-quality CPR. Because you all know this, if you go faster, you trade depth. If you try to go deeper, you trade rate. So I think the sweet spot is almost impossible, and only 12% of the students know how to do this six months later. And we only have one shot to train them. So I think that we can probably improve upon this. That's what led us to create Heart Class. Again, as a little story and encouragement for those of you who have big dreams and no money, this was a big dream and very little money. Um, this all came from a conversation that I had at a conference with a film director. Last time I spoke to you all, I showed you his work in the UK. Remember that British version of the film that we showed you with Daisy Ridley from Star Wars? So Martin presented at um, the American Heart Association resuscitation meeting. We were all just fascinated by his work, and we all said we have to make an American version. So like everyone else at the conference, I went up to Martin, I gave him my card, and said I'd love to work with you, including people who've been in the resuscitation field for 30 years. Guess who was the first person to make it happen? Me, because I just pushed hard, <laughs> and because we begged, borrowed, and stealed, and Martin gave us a big discount. <laughs> um, and I think I say that because when you go to meetings and when you're networking, you really never know what's going to come of it. And for me, one conversation at one meeting where I just happened to catch the right session has become the defining work of my career so far. So what is Heart Class? Well, Heart Class is an interactive film, and it is designed specifically for a high school classroom. It can be used in other settings, but we designed this for a classroom with a group of high schoolers. What happens is that we separate the classroom into two teams. We are going to do this today, don't worry. And the two teams are competing against one another to answer questions and also to perform CPR. It's a dramatic film. It really looks like someone's having a cardiac arrest. And instead of lecturing them on cardiac arrest and CPR, we teach them through the film. And they watch high school students do CPR that they can identify with. By a quick show of hands, who in here has ever taken a CPR training course? Raise your hand. Okay. Who has ever found their CPR training course to be stimulating in the least? Right? So boring. I may have let my ACLS. Okay. It's so boring. So we wanted to make this more exciting and, and interesting for a group of 13 to 14 year old kids. Anyone ever taught in high school or done anything with 13 to 14 year old kids? Their attention span is impossibly short. So trying to do something that will capture their attention and lead to better skill retention was really our goal. Okay, so I'm going to show you this film today. I would will need two brave volunteers from the audience to perform chest compressions up here for me. I know there's some residents who want to get their work done today. Please come on down. One other. Oh, <laughs> I see you in the back there. Excellent, AJ, come on down. <laughs> it's already been featured in this uh, presentation, and I totally threw you under the bus. <laughs> AJ worked with me. Uh, it was one of the students who was uh, uh, testing CPR skill. Okay, anyone else want to come down, please? I need one of the person to compete. Right. All right, my other research students. See, look at this. My team is here to support me. All right, you guys can sit there for just a second because the um, film is going to um, go through a little teaching first before we do CPR. Okay, so what we're going to do is you guys split right down the middle here. You're going to be Team Heart. So whenever the film asks a question for Team Heart, you got to shout out the answer. This is time limited, so you better be on top of it. You guys are Team Class. Okay, competition between the two teams for pride and glory. Uh, I should just say that um, the way we designed this film is so that it's a press play kind of scenario for the teacher. So the idea is that the teacher needs to know nothing about CPR. They, there is an intro that we tell them how to set up the classroom so that they kind of know the setup. But then all they have to do is have the laptop or a computer with Google Chrome. They press play, have some speakers. And the class is going to learn CPR without really any other um, uh, resources. 
The mannequin problem we're working on, I think it's ideal to have this kind of mannequin. We do offer in the teacher's intro this very cheap alternative that I saw at this last year's meeting, where you take a two liter soda bottle that's empty and you have to cap on so there's air in it, put it inside a t-shirt and stuff the t-shirt with a newspaper and then it like looks like a torso and you press on the bottle. It's actually better than that thing. Um, so that's another option if in really resource limited environment. Okay, so we're not going to watch the whole thing, but we are going to watch a good portion of this. Can you guys hear it? All right, let's get started, ladies. Come on. All right, come on. Keep it going. One after the other. Don't stop. Woo! Come on now. I want to speak at every free throw this week. Let's go. Keep it going, keep it going, keep it going. Let's love, ladies, back in line. Come on, come on, come on, come on. There it is. Good shot, Sarah. Good shot. Woo! Uh, ladies, just uh, keep going. I'll, I'll be right back. Mr. Ryan, are you okay? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. Mr. Ryan? Alex, guys, come in here. Mr. Ryan? Now, here's a question for Team Hart. What would you do now? Put Mr. Ryan on his side? Or try to get him to respond to you. Imagine you're a high schooler, okay? Get in the mindset. Good. But now here's a question for team class. How do you get a response? Tilt his head back? Or shake him and shout, Are you okay? They want points on this. You're right. Mr. Ryan? Mr. Ryan, are you okay? Mr. Ryan? Oh my god. Mr. Ryan? Oh my god. Mr. Ryan? Oh, what happened? I don't, I don't know. Mr. Oh. Ryan? Mr. Ryan? So, is he responding? <laughs> All right. <Whew. laughs> You're right. Call 911. No. Oh my oh, are god. Are you crazy? Just wait for Ms. Brown to come back. Call. She'll be back any minute. We learned this in school. Call 911. No. no. We're going to get in trouble. So, do you call 911 now? <laughs> That's right. If someone's not responding, like Mr. Ryan, then call 911 or get someone else to do it. If you don't want to do it, I'll do it. That's Alex. fine, but you're taking the fall for it, not me. Mr. Ryan? Mr. Ryan? Put it on speaker. What now? Check for normal breathing? For lay people. Or check his pulse. What's the rule for lay people? It is breathing. Everyone gets you're that right. Wrong. 911. Where is your emergency? Um, we're at Lincoln High School. Tell me exactly what happened. I don't know. Um, our coach, he, he just fell on the ground. Um, uh, uh, he's not responding to us. Uh, we don't know what to do. Help is on the way. Now put him on the floor. Face up. Kneel beside his chest. Okay, my friend Sarah's doing that. Is he breathing normally? So... Is he breathing normally? Yes or no? You'd be surprised. You're right. He's not breathing normally. When someone's had a cardiac arrest, they sometimes do slow, labored gasps that can make strange sounds, like you saw with Mr. Ryan. This is not real breathing. Without CPR, Mr. Ryan will be dead in five minutes. Yeah, he's, he's breathing fine. fine. No, he's not. If he's breathing like that, he's dying. <laughs> no, 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 he's not. We are going to start CPR. Did you say CPR? Oh, okay. I'll I'll start CPR. So now it's time to do CPR. It's actually a minute or two. So CPR I'll call group you guys one up when we're ready. should get into position now. But first, let's see how you do CPR. If you're doing CPR on Mr. Ryan, where do you push? 
on the left circle or the right circle. That's correct. You push hard and fast in the center of the chest, between his nipples, on his chest bone. How do you put your hands? Side by side or with fingers locked? If they don't need to do CPR, yes. <laughs> you lock your fingers together, one hand on top of the other. Push with the heel of your hand. What about your arms? Bend them or keep them straight. That's right. You keep your arms straight. So if your arms are straight, how do you push? By bending your arms or by pushing with your body? Exactly. You keep your arms straight and you push by moving your upper body up and down, like Sarah's doing. With an adult like Mr. Ryan, how deep do you push? Exactly. You push down about two to two and a half inches. That's as deep as a baseball. And what about after each push? Do you let his chest go back all the way or just halfway? Yeah. That's right. Which none of us do. After by the each way. push, let his chest spring back up all the way, but keep your hands on his chest. And finally, how fast will you push? Do some quick math there. <laughs> That's right. You push down just two times a second, but no faster. That sounds like this. You may find that easier to do if you say something to yourself to keep the rhythm. For example, two inches, 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 two inches. And now we're ready to go. All right, guys, come on up. Position yourself. CPR group one, get ready. Then press the button to start CPR. <laughs> okay, so now the students are ready and I'll show you some footage of what this looks like in the classroom cheer on your classmates, but it's going to tell you there's still action going on while they're doing CPR, just like there would be in real life. Listen to the beat. Down. Start CPR on a count of five. Five, four, three, two, one, go. Two inches, 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 two inches. Don't stop CPR if you're doing it now. But for the rest of you, here's a question. Could Sarah break Mr. Ryan's ribs? Yes or no? Yes, she could certainly break his ribs, but that's okay, because without CPR, he'll die. What's the symbol for an AED? <laughs> Kids don't know what that other one is. Um, there's one in the cafeteria. I'll go get it. Keep going, guys. Right. Sarah, continue CPR until the AED arrives. <laughs> Sarah, stop! You don't know what you're doing. Yes, I do. CPR Group One. Stop CPR now. All right, a round of applause for CPR What's group one. Score for that CPR session. You guys can have a seat, thank you. I won't make us do it through the whole thing, but I am gonna show you more. So now the teacher will choose. That was absolutely a tie. Of course, my research students know how to do perfect CPR. Great job, guys, thank you. I'm gonna show you a little bit more, CPR but there's gonna be two. another Get group ready. Would be doing CPR Then now. press the button. So once they're all ready, then the teacher presses the button, but I want to show you- Start the CPR on the count of five. Five, four, three, two, one, go. Two inches, 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 two inches. Um, I've got the AED. Great. Turn it on and follow the instructions. I'm here if you need any help. Keep doing CPR until help arrives. Remove all clothing. From patient chest. 
You have to unzip his jacket. Oh, hurry up, unzip okay. it. This is where all the high schoolers get really uncomfortable. They all like. Red handle to open bag. A defibrillator? Are you even trying to use that? Do you need training to use an AED? Same class. Look it's at fine, you just follow the pictures! Pad. Peel one pad off blue plastic. Apply pad to bare skin, exactly as shown in the picture. Where do you stick the pads? Like in the picture on the left? Or the picture on the right? Yeah, we did this wrong in the hospital all the time. Exactly. Don't let me see that. One pad goes above the collarbone. The other pad goes on the side of the ribs. Press pad firmly. Just follow the picture. Okay, Hurry up, okay, put it okay. on. Right here? Yes, follow the I picture. Peel other pad off blue plastic. Just follow the picture, put it on. Apply right pad here? Yes. To bare skin. Press it hard, yes. Exactly as shown in the picture. Press pad firmly. Do not touch patient. So what now? There we go. CPR group two, stop CPR now. What's the score for that CPR session? Hmm, I feel like Team Heart won that time. <laughs> Oh. Evaluating heart rhythm. Why couldn't we just wait for the ambulance to arrive? You're gonna kill him! It's fine, it won't shock him unless it has to. Stand by. Preparing to shock. What? Everyone you just said... clear. Press flashing button. So, what do you do now? Wait for the ambulance, or press the shock button? <laughs> no, 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 Sarah, you can't. I have... No, you can't! <laughs> Uh, do you want me to do it? Okay, I'm going to skip forward. Uh, someone goes to get the ambulance, and they shock him again. CPR group three. Ready? Start CPR on a... Start CPR on a count of five. I want to show you the ending. Five, four, three, two, one, go. Two inches, two inches, two inches, two inches, two inches. Two inches. Ah, sorry, let me forward. It won't let me, but we will. Try this one. There we go. Group four. Okay. So there's a whole Start round where they CPR stop Start CPR on again. a count of five. Five, four, three, two, one, go. Two inches, 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 two inches. Um, uh, my friend's doing CPR again. Mr. Ryan? Oh, um, Mr. Ryan, are you okay? Moving. Mr. Ryan? Mr. Ryan? He's waking Mr. up, Ryan? he stops. Mr. Ryan did start to move. So, can you stop doing CPR now? Can you? Uh. Exactly. You should only stop CPR when the victim is definitely waking up, moving, opening their eyes, and breathing normally. So for now, you have to keep on doing CPR. Uh, Mr. Ryan? Mr. Hey, Ryan? Can you? you hear us? Um, no, 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 he's not. Okay. Keep doing CPR. Okay. Can, uh, can you hear us? Um, he just pushed my friend's hand Mr. out of the way. Are you okay? Is he awake and breathing normally? He's, he's, he's breathing. He's yes, breathing. Yes, yes, he is, he is. That's great. You can stop CPR now. CPR group four. Stop CPR now. What's the score for that CPR session? Definitely team class. So good. Mr. Ryan, Ryan? Very good. 
So at this point, if the class is Mr. too big, you can Mr. go Ryan? back to the beginning to get everyone through. Are you okay, through. Mr. Ryan? EMS. What's going on? What happened? Um, our basketball coach, Mr. Ryan, came out and passed out, and we've been giving him CPR on the phone with 911. Um, he wasn't breathing. Out. Um, we gave him two shots. Okay, I feel a pulse. Mr. Ryan, can you hear me? All right, he's responsive. Awesome job, guys. <laughs> Recap. Mr. Ryan spent two weeks in the hospital, but he made a complete recovery. Without your CPR and the shocks that you gave him, he would have died. Team Heart, this is your score. And Team Class, this oh, is your score. Good tie, good job. Well done. <laughs> and congratulations to every one of you for learning CPR. Because you may need to do this for real tomorrow. If someone's collapsed and they're not responding or breathing, then call 911 and try to get an AED. Push hard and fast in the center of their chest. Keep your arms straight. Push by moving your body up and down, not by bending your arms. Push two times a second. Push down two to two and a half inches. Let the chest go back up after each push. Use an AED if you've got one. No training is needed. Keep going until help arrives. Do it right, and you could save someone's life. And that's the real end. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I mean, I feel like it was Emmy worthy, but whatever. Um, so uh, we were very grateful um, that with a heart class that was done right here in Louisville, that was Ballard High School, that was Louisville Metro EMS that showed up, those were local actors. Um, so we really had the whole community behind us in making this film. Um, it was really also the most fun week of work I've ever had. Um, we were fortunate to win this award. We were like the web video of the day or something, so that's cool. Um, but also the Kentucky chapter of the ACC has endorsed our method of training, getting back to that, uh, method, that discussion I was having about national endorsement. We do have Kentucky ACC on board, and actually after this talk today, I have a phone call with someone from the state government to try and talk about getting this into more high schools across uh, the Commonwealth. Um, so you want some data? I want to show you some data. So we actually compared heart class with standard training to look at CPR skill acquisition. We will be going back in a month to look at their retention at the end of the year. But first we went into high school, so this is the group. They were taught by their teacher, um, who was a CPR certified instructor. And then we came in the next day, we brought all of these inflatable mannequins because we wanted to replicate what is happening in most schools. Inflatable mannequins cost about $40 each. They last for about 1,000 compressions. The non-inflatable mannequins cost around 250 each. So schools are definitely not buying 10 of those non-inflatable mannequins. So they learned on these. As you can see, they're like stopping chest compressions, not paying attention, whatever. So they did their standard training. And then we compared that to other schools where we did heart class training. We showed them the video. We had them separated into groups. Every single person in the class has a chance to do CPR during that film because we would line up about eight mannequins and have a group of four behind each mannequin. And then the, within those four groups of CPR, everyone has a chance to do hands-on. So we measured, after these trainings, we measured the rate of compressions and the percentage that were at appropriate depth. Um, when you look at any of the studies that are showing you how good is a CPR training course, they usually report the mean or the median chest compression rate and depth. That doesn't matter at all, because if everyone who knows statistics knows that if you have enough people, then your means are going to be appropriate. What really matters is a threshold effect. What percentage of the participants are performing high quality CPR? And so that's how we've chosen to report our metrics. So the percentage who are at the correct rate and the percentage who can reach that 70% appropriate depth mark. And most importantly, the combined. What percentage of them are performing high quality CPR, both the rate and the depth correct? 
So this is the graph comparing standard in the salmon color to the film in purple. This is our null line. Above this line, that means that they did that 70% correct depth threshold. Below is incorrect depth. And then we have separated into tertiles, too slow, just right, and too fast. So in the Goldilocks spot here, right, just right, you can see that our film, Heart Class, blows standard training out of the water. We almost double the percentage of students who can perform high quality CPR. Now, the absolute number is still a little disappointing, 13 versus 22 percent. But that 13 percent is pretty much exactly the same as when we looked at CPR skill retention previously. So there seems to be some kind of threshold there. The other important thing that we learned is that absolutely everybody goes too fast. These are young, enthusiastic kids. They have adrenaline. Some of them get up to do the testing and they're like, I'm nervous. Um, and so they just go way too fast. Now what's impressive is a lot of them are able to get the correct depth even while going too fast. We only measure them for 60 seconds. So there is pro the possibility that if we measured them for a longer time, usually what happens is your depth gets sacrificed. Um, but they may slow down and that may allow them to get the correct rate. So this is a problem we're trying to figure out if we can address that um, the issue of how fast they're going. So the questions that we have is what's making the difference? I mentioned already the mannequins. It could be that this is just an artifact of mannequins. I don't think so, but it's possible. Um, what's very important and what we've learned from doing heart class is uh, what I think the power is, is that it forces the students to do a full one to two minutes of CPR in a row. If you've ever taught CPR to high schoolers, and if, like we do in the standard training, They'll do 10 compressions and then stop. And then they'll do another five and like, oh, that makes my arm hurt. Um, and so they never, and they're laughing and joking, whatever. So they never sit there and are forced to do a full minute. And getting a whole classroom, if you have a mannequin for each person, getting a classroom of 30 students to do a full two minutes of CPR is like hurting cats. So I think the power of the film is that everyone is watching the eight students who are doing CPR. The narrator is telling them, don't stop. And so they are forced to really get the muscle memory of how to do CPR for an extended period of time. There's also the power of the synchronicity. So you could hear the mannequins going when AJ and John were both doing the chest compressions. That's amazing when you're in a gym and you have eight mannequins going at the same time. And so they really, um, I think that there's some power in that peer pressure. So the other questions we're gonna ask is that, is this a lack of skill acquisition versus retention? So we'll know in a month what happens when we go back into schools? Did the skills um, um, decrease over time or is it just that they never learned in the first place? Mannequin cost is something that we're working on. Um, I mentioned already how expensive these devices are. And so we are maybe, not at liberty to say, but we might be working on designing something that's better and more cost effective. And then I mentioned the one minute time frame as well. Um, so what are we working on next? Well, we're actually trying to develop the interactivity if we can turn this into a video game where not only are you doing the chest compressions, but you see the quality of your compressions up on the screen, I want it to feel like, you know, like the pinball championship, where it's like one of those 1980s video game competitions in the whole room and you're cheering for your classmates. So we're working on making this into a live action video game of sorts. We also have in the works, if we get the funding, new films. It turns out that women receive CPR 30% less than men in public because people are afraid of bras and where do I put the, the device and all that kind of thing. So if we can demystify the female specific CPR issues and show a female victim, that'd be great. I mentioned that all of the students freak out when they unzip his jacket, then they get over it. So we need that shock factor so that they're not scared to undress as appropriate the victim and do the defibrillator. We also would like to do a Spanish language film. There are only on all of the internet three high quality CPR instructional videos in Spanish. There's like five billion videos on YouTube every day or whatever. And there's three high quality Spanish language films. So we'd like to do that. If you want to give me money, I'd gladly take it. And then we're working on the endorsement and national recognition because we really want to get this spread. So if any of you have connections with educators at large in particular, I'm hoping that the Kentucky state government is going to endorse this as the best method, um, but we're still working on that across the US. And the real question is, does it matter? Does any of this lead to improved survival? I believe it will, but we need to prove that. Um, so just before I take questions in the last little bit, um, I want to show you what this looks like when we do it in the classroom. We made this short little commercial 
so that if any of you do have someone you want to send this to, I can send you this link and they can quickly see what it's about. So it will be a little bit of a recap, but just want to show you what it looks like in the classrooms. Mr. Ryan? Mr. Ryan? Mr. Ryan, are you okay? Call 911. No, no. we're gonna get in trouble. We learned this in school. Call 911. You're gonna break his ribs. Sarah, stop! Shut up! Sarah, stop! You don't know what you're doing. Yes, I do! Do not touch patients. Oh. Why couldn't we just wait for the ambulance to arrive? Hey, you're gonna kill him! No, sir, you can't! <laughs> sir, you can't! Perfect, that's fine. Shock delivered. Recent medical research compared heart class with traditional American high school CPR training. It tested over. With heart class, the percentage of students who performed high quality CPR improved by no less than 90%. So more kids will be able to save lives. But how does heart class work? Well, most American high schools today can't afford to give each student a computer. So heart class works interactive, just one computer for a class of 30 students. It does this by using group interaction. The teacher splits the class into two rival teams, Team Heart and Team Class. The game starts by asking questions to each team in turn. But no, you're going to break his ribs! Now here's a question for Team Class. Could Sarah break Mr. Ryan's ribs? Yes or no? Team Class! Yes. If they get it right, they win points, and the scores are shown at the top of the screen. Then, when the actors in the game perform CPR, the students perform CPR in their teams. Team class is winning this one. Team Hardfighter, step it up. And at the end of the game, one team wins. But they've all learned how to save a life better with heart class. Pulse, Mr. Ryan, can you hear me? Awesome job, guys. All right, you guys have the idea. <laughs> so that's our little commercial that we uh, have to basically show people about it. So um, I'll end and um, just thank a lot of people who are involved. Many of my research students are here today who came with me into high school to implement this, to test the skill retention. All the people who worked with us on the film, it was really a huge collaborative effort. Um, and then just to show you a little bit behind the scenes, um, here we are going into schools, representing U of L, having a lot of fun. Oh man, that gym was so hot that day. Um, here is our film crew when we wrapped up filming, which was also super fun. Martin, my film director. Um, here we are on the set. It's a real life movie set with like, and cut, all the kind of stuff. It was kind of my lifelong dream. Uh, here were the paramedics showing up to do this, and then I have to thank my sweet husband, who was actually the victim. <laughs> and this was within the first month of our marriage, so I said, you're already playing dead. This is not good, but uh, Amy's wearing my makeup to make him look so dead. He's very handsome. So anyway, uh, it was a family project, which has been a lot of fun. He is so sick of hearing this film as I listened again and again for the narrator and the music. We can both uh, say it by heart. So thank you very much, and I'll take any questions or comments. So yeah. Yep. Yep. Yes. So hands-only CPR has been shown in studies to be just as effective as mouth-to-mouth, -mouth, and so it's a really powerful deterrent if you have to be mouth-to-mouth. -mouth. And so we remind them these kids are so young that most of them never have even heard of CPR training with mouth-to-mouth but the teachers are all surprised to learn that you don't have to do rescue breathing. Great question. Other questions or comments? Yeah.
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we do, uh, there is a registry that we participate in called the CARES registry that looks at um, survival by zip code. And so we have looked at that in the past, mostly where I was looking at um, rates of bystander CPR by zip code and survival by zip code. We are collecting from the students what zip code they live in, mostly because we want to look at socioeconomic status, because there is a very strong, as with everything, unfortunately, lower uh, areas with lower socioeconomic status have much lower rates of bystander CPR and survival. So it's my long way of saying, yes, we could, um, but it's a longer term project, of course. Yes, hello. That's right, yeah, so the muscle memory is so crucially important. Um, and that's something that Martin and I, the filmmaker, argued over. When he made the version in the UK, the idea was it was the smartphone, on the smartphone, and that you would just do this, and the, it would use the accelerometer in the smartphone to measure if you were doing appropriate rate and depth. But that is totally problematic because it doesn't form muscle memory. So the mannequin is really important. I mentioned that um, Coke bottle pseudo mannequin, which we have in the teacher's intro so that they can tell the students the night before. Everyone, unfortunately, has a two liter Coke bottle at home that they can use. Um, but that's the next step of our project of what we're working on is, um, again, it's secretive, but can we engineer something that is cheaper and more effective um, than these mannequins and kind of disrupt this million dollar industry? So wish me luck with that. <laughs> Anything else? Good question. So the question is about um, why do we tell them to look for breathing instead of a pulse? So it turns out that even medical professionals, when we ask them to find a pulse, they've done this study, we're right about 50% of the time. And a lay person has a really hard time knowing where to feel for the pulse. And so the recommendation became to just look for normal breathing because if they are down unconscious and not breathing normally, chances are they're in a cardiac arrest. And if they're not, then they'll swat you away when you try to do the chest compressions. So we teach look for normal breathing. You all, oh, I, I did want to mention that. Everyone was laughing because you thought, oh, this is all so obvious. But if you try to remember back to before you were a medical professional, you didn't know what agonal breathing meant. And you just think, no, they are breathing. And it's a big problem. I even have a, a friend of mine whose wife is a pediatrician and their neighbor collapsed. And she was uncertain of whether or not he was breathing normally because in the heightened adrenaline of the situation, no one's first thought is, ah, better just go ahead and on their chest, right? You want, you're looking for every excuse to not. So that's why we focus so much on the agonal breathing in this film. And every question that we ask is because it's a point, a sticking point for lay people to do CPR. And so we try to really focus on all those things to teach. You also laughed at the, do you need training for an AED? That question came from Martin's experience in the UK that so many people who watched his film said, I, I didn't know you could use it without training. I didn't know it would tell you what to do. So we're actually trying to take ourselves out of the healthcare mindset. I was glad at your responses because you illustrated why maybe as healthcare professionals, we have a hard time making courses that make sense for the lay public. And one other comment I'll mention before I finish, we wanted to make this dramatic because although most of us have unfortunately seen someone die or have a cardiac arrest, lay people have not. And this is a very uh, adrenaline charged situation. At the moment where he collapses, we had a student run out of the room in tears. So of course I thought, great, oh no, she's had a family member have a cardiac arrest and this is traumatic for her. I followed her out and I said, you know, what's going on? And she said, well, my dad has heart disease and so I'm just worried about him. So I comforted her and said, well, this is a good opportunity to learn. She came back in that room and she would not leave until she got 100% correct. So there's power behind the drama of the film and getting people into a space where they might I have not only muscle memory, but also kind of emotional memory, if you will. Okay, it's half time. Thank you all for your time. <laughs>